Colossians chapter 2. And we're beginning with verse 4, and we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. Yesterday morning I was visiting uh, with the pastor at Indian Hills, Jesse Randolph, who, by the way, will be speaking at our banquet, our Thanksgiving banquet. And he's preaching in Colossians as well. So uh, I said, uh, there's some in our church who have been listening to your messages online, and uh, they come to me for me to clean it up. <laughs> it's not true. But uh, he does a good job, and uh, we were talking about uh, the section in which he's beginning this morning, which is Colossians 2.8. And that talks about the philosophies and the heresies that crept into the church at Colossae. And he said, what do you think they are? And I said, quite frankly, I don't know exactly. There's a little bit of Hebrew legalism. There's a little bit of Gnosticism in it. And there's a little bit of just general heresy. And he said, you know, I've not found anybody who can really in any commentary, just nailed down what that philosophy is. And we kind of both came to conclusion is that God left it vague. Because there's all kinds, how can you list all the heresies that have arisen or will arise, even though they have one thing in common. They deny the deity of Christ, and they deny salvation by grace alone in Christ alone. That is the one thing that all heresies uh, agree on. Other than that, there's a lot of variation with these heresies. So Paul in this section is reminding his church at Colossae, how do you avoid this? What are you going to do when these heresies come? And how do you prepare yourself as a body of Christ or an individual when heresy does come? And we looked at the previous verse and we noticed there were at least four things. That what you can do. Number one, you can be knit together in love. That is a medical metaphor, and it speaks of the bodies being knit together bones, muscles, tendons, and all of those things that come together to form a body. And to form the, to form the action of the body. It's amazing to me that you think one thing, your hand reaches just automatically out. You don't have to say, hand now, move to the left, raise a little bit, move to that. You may have to if you're sick, but you don't normally do that. It just automatically goes. It's knit together. Secondly, there's an attainment to the wealth that comes from full assurance of understanding, which in fact is that the more you know, the more you're assured that confidence, knowing God's word, grounds you when the heresy comes, or the division or schism may come, that you recognize this is wrong. There's something not right about this. Thirdly, a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ in himself. And uh, in Christ, you know that we have a mystery. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We are in Christ, actually. We're part of his uh, body as believers. And knowing that gives us the confidence as well to stand firm. In whom are all the hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. It's important for the church to know the wisdom that comes from Christ through his word. And it's also to know the knowledge that we have so that when things crop up, we automatically know. If you're a mechanic and you hear something going wrong in an engine, you may say, I know exactly what that is. The more you know about the engine, the better you are. And so when we, the more we know about the Word of God and the more we know about Christ himself, the better off we are and uh, we can recognize it. Years ago, our bank, uh, where we had in Kansas City, uh, I would go and our budget was that as I'd cash our check, X amount would go to the groceries and so forth, and I'd give Faith that cash. So she went to Kmart and was 
paying for something and a lady looked at a $20 bill, marked it and said, excuse me. And the, the manager came back and said, this is counterfeit. I often wondered what a counterfeit bill looked like. And so I went to the bank and I said, you know, I was just here 10, 15 minutes ago and we got several $20 bills in that thing. They're phony. And the bank is really not obligated to pay you. And so she said, our tellers are taught how to find out by feeling just that particular bill. And so she, I was a regular customer, so she took the bills and turned them in to somebody. But we, the more we know, the more we can pick out that which is phony when they try to pass it. A friend of mine went and adopted a baby from Russia, and he had to have like $24,000, $20,000 cash to take over there. And so he took a few others, and he's some little town, and it's where they make these dolls put them apart and there's another little doll inside and you know all the way down. There was a grandma sitting there and so he bought the doll from her and handed her a, a bill and she said it's phony. Even a gal in Russia could tell <laughs> that this money was phony. So the more you know, the more we have, the better off we are of understanding. That's what Paul is saying. Now in verse 4 he gives us a warning. He has a heartfelt feeling for the church in verse 1. He wants the church to be built up in verse 2. He shows us the wisdom of Christ in verse 3, and now he gives us the warning. It is inevitable that false teaching will make an attempt to infiltrate the church, and church history is full of churches that have fallen, even in my lifetime. Church is good. This church is no exception. It will, it has, and it will be some way, somehow, false teaching will make an attempt at this body. For example, Paul wrote the letter to Colossians, and at that time, our Ephesus, from which Colossians church was formed, was one of the mightiest churches in that area. Paul's last visit to that church is recorded in Acts chapter 20, verses 25 to 31. This is Paul on his way to Jerusalem, stopping by the church, didn't even go to Ephesus, but met on the coast as he was there. And here's what he said to this, to the elders. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will no longer see my face. This is the last visit. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of men. I've done everything I could to this church. Whatever happens here <clears throat> is not my problem. I'm free. And here's why I'm free. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. I try to do that too. I, I, I don't know how successful I am, but that's my point. The church needs to know about the creation. The church needs to know about eternal life heaven and hell, and everything in between. Nothing should be left out. And that's why I like verse-by-verse -verse teaching. You're forced to deal with passages many people skip over. You're forced to deal with the controversial passages. You're forced to deal with issues where, where uh, people want to tend to glide over and have a hundred dis different opinions in your body. So Paul says, I didn't shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Then he warns them in verse 28, be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, leaders, to shepherd the church of God, 
which he purchased with his own blood. You know what it costs to put up this church? Not a million five for this auditorium or whatever we need to spend to expand the building. That's, that cost is nothing compared to what God paid for this church and you. He paid his son. He gave his son for this church. Christ Jesus came voluntarily to purchase you out of the lifestyle of sin, forgive you, and place you on a rock. And he indwelt you by the Spirit, and you live in him. That's a tremendous a price that God paid. You, you may come here for free, and you may attend it, and you may give something, and you may not. But I can tell you what, I know what God gave for this church. How important it is to him. You may take it or leave it, but it's important to God what goes on in this body. God is more concerned about what goes on in countryside than he is in the Congress. Do you believe that? I don't think you do, but <laughs> you should. He's interested in you. He's interested in your personal life. You know what Psalm says? Psalm 139. I know where you sit. I know how many times you sit in that chair. I know when you rise up, when you lie down, I know how many times it takes for you to brush your teeth. I know all about you. You can't go to Sheol, place of the dead. And you can't go into heaven, but I know everything about you. And Jesus reiterates that when he says, I know the hair, the care count on your head. Not a big problem for some of us. <laughs> but the point is he knows. He knows all about us. And he says, I know that. He says that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. Not sparing the flock. I think the, the use of a wolf is kind of interesting because they are mean looking. Now people love them, but they are mean looking. And they have long legs and they can move and they can chase a herd. And you know, I've watched uh, films on them. I haven't seen it personally, but like in Yellowstone, when a wolf goes after a pack of elk, for example, who are much larger than a wolf... They run them till they're tired, and then they pick out the weakest one, and a whole group will go. Now, one elk, wolf can't take down a wolf uh, elk by itself, but it nips at the back of the leg, and it nips over here, and finally that elk gets tired, and it goes down, and when it slows down, more wolves come in. That's what heresy does to a church. It starts with the weakest. It starts with those that come to church and go to church and listening to podcasts and getting all their information out of a radio program or a TV program or reading a book and not being in the Word themselves. Not really paying attention to what the Bible says. And so he hears a little bit here, it sounds good, and down they go. Now, where do these savage wolves come from? Look at verse 20, uh, look at verse 30. They come from among your own selves. Men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw disciples after them. They want to they wanna follow him. So what do they do? They go to the elders and say, I want you to know I want to spread a little bit of untruth in this church. No. That's a, probably the last group that hears it. They go and they pick out certain people who have these tendencies and who are not really grounded themselves. Sounds good. And also they come from the outside. He said, uh, they'll come from your own self and uh, they'll come in, as he said in verse 29, come from all over which requires the congregation and its leaders 
to be alert, to pay attention. He ends it up, this section at least, verse 31, Therefore be on the alert, <clears throat> strength, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one of you with tears. Prayed for you, cared for you, prayed over your soul, even though I may not know I pray for you, personally. If I hear a request, I pray for that too, as we all should. Now look what happened to this church. Paul started it. Timothy was its preacher. John, the writer of the book of John, was a pastor in this church. Would you say that's probably got to be a church with all kinds of really good preachers? Go to Revelation. Chapter 2. Less than 50 years later, 50 years, that's not long in, in history, is it? Here's what the Lord had John write about this church as he records it. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, talks about the church, their doctrinal correctness. They were doctrinally correct. If a Nicolaitan was in there, man, they, they tied him to the pole. But here's what he said. But I have this against you. This is the Lord. You have let, left your first love. That joy, that enthusiasm that you had when you first got saved and you got in into the Word and you were in a Bible study and you really enjoyed it. You enjoyed hearing the Word of God. And you wanted to get to a place where you heard of God. But you know, things changed. You get in school and kids get in school and activities start to conflict. And uh, you get interested in other things, hunting, fishing, sports, whatever. And it just starts, you know, it's a championship game and we have church. Well, I'll, I'll make it up somewhere else. Casual about it. You know, when you were first dating, now, uh, some of you are too old to remember, but <laughs> some of you can still remember this. Uh, when you were in love and it was, you're definitely headed for marriage, uh, you, you would do anything to be with that person, would you not? This means yes. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Yeah. Admit it. Love of your life. That's your first love. Now you've been married 40 years. A lot of us marriages, a lot of our marriages have fiddled down to toleration. That first love is, yeah, okay. I hope that's not true of your marriage. But anyway, it happened to the church at Ephesus. It happened to the church of Ephesus. Now here's what he says about that church. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Get back in the word. Get back in enjoying prayer. Get back and fall in love with Christ. Remember where you've fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of the place unless you repent. What about the city of Ephesus? The city of Ephesus that the church was is nothing more than a bunch of ruins. Interesting ruins, but it's ruin. No church here. How long did it take? Fifty years and maybe a little more. Now, we take a look at our verse. See that no one deludes you. I say this so that no one will delude you. Now, delude is a strong word. It actually only occurs uh, twice in the New Testament. And here's what Vine says about this word. 
He identifies it, Vine. If you don't have a dictionary of expository words by Vine, get it. If you really want to study the word. Really, a, an old scholar who has defined, you can look it up in English. You want to look up delude, you go to Vine, look up delude, and he'll show you where to look. And you look up delude, and he has a whole list of where every word is used and what it means in the Greek. Good scholar. But he says it's a wandering whereby those who are led astray, uh, roam hither and thither, is always using the New Testament of mental strain, wrong opinion, error in morals, or religion. Now here's where it's used again. Look at 2 Thessalonians. I got it on the board for you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so they will believe what is false. You know where that appears? In the history of the church? He's speaking about the time right after the rapture. Okay, let's say the rapture happens this afternoon and every believer goes to heaven. What about the people that are left? What, a, what about the people that come to church here next Sunday and nobody's here? What are they going to say? They all must have gone in the rapture. They'll believe a lie. Somebody in the country, in the world, will come up with a phony way of this taking place when millions of people suddenly disappear. How the world going to explain that? I don't know, but I believe there's a way that's going to happen, and just possibly. Have you looked at the movies lately? I mean, not gone there, but just looked at the previews that come up on wherever they come up. They're weird, aren't they? <laughs> Aliens and all kinds of stuff. Not my kind of movie. I like it where it's you got a guy wearing a white hat riding a white horse. <laughs> but all kinds of stuff. Fighting each other out in space and whatever. Conditioning, maybe, in one way, people to accept the weird. And accept, well, this is really weird, but maybe there's an, uh, something happened here. Whatever it is, it's going to be a lie. Now, you live in America, and you look at the government. Are you used to them lying to you? Sure you are. We don't have this problem, and you look at TV, and it's all over the place. And stand up and say, we have no problem. Come on. People believe that. Even though they see it, they believe it. God will delude them so that they will come up with some phony explanation about the rapture of the church and people will follow it. Didn't Jesus say, the blind follow the blind? Paul had, I want to take you to an example of a church that really had problems. Go with me to the book of, first, just think of it now, and I'll give you a passage. Think of, think of what was going on at the church at Corinth. I don't think any of you have gone to a church that all of these things were going on at the same time. First of all, there was a sectarianism between Paul, Apollos, and a Christ-only group. It's schism. Secondly, there was an arrogance among the members claiming superiority over others. Thirdly, there was a toleration of immorality, incest going on in the church. Fourthly, members of the church taking others' members to court, suing each other. That's wrong. If you've got two members in a church and have a problem, set them down and let's work it out. With the Bible, let the Holy Spirit lead. Isn't that the way we're supposed to handle problems? Not running around all over and going to court over these things. 
Five, problems of mixed marriages, believers with unbelievers. Six, the problem of eating meat that had been dedicated to an idol. Seven, the difficulty about paying full-time workers in the church. Eight, the problems of drunkenness, listen to this, at church dinners. And communion. Can you imagine that? We've never had that problem here, in my knowledge. The problem or the misuse of spiritual gifts like tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecies, miracles. Had to straighten all that out. Ten, the question over the resurrection of Christ and believers. Now, Paul makes a very interesting statement about all this. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11... Verses 18 and 19. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses uh, 18 and 19. Here's what Paul says about the church. And he's talking about the communion. In a communion section. For in this place, when you come together as a church... I hear there are divisions that exist among you, and in part I believe it. You had one, you had one group sitting on one side. You probably had the McCoys on one side, and what's the other group who fought the McCoys? Hatfields, both in the same church. Believe it or not. Well, I can believe it. <laughs> Let me tell you, that happens. Little clicks spring up all the time. And that's sin. Pure sin. He said, well, I believe it. Now, here's what he says. For there must also be factions among you. Why? For the purpose, that's a purpose clause, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. What happens when a faction comes up? What happens when a problem comes in the church? God could say, no, we're not going to have this problem. I'll eliminate it right off the bat. What does he say? They're going to come up among you so that people will be approved and become among, evident among you. Who are the real spiritual Christians here? In Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, Paul says... If you see somebody in a fault, what are you supposed to do? Find an elder? Tell somebody else? What are you supposed to do? You that are spiritual, what? Restore him. And be careful. Consider yourself. Because you're liable to the very same thing they're doing. Do you remember that verse? This means yes. That's what we're supposed to do. You see, it approves who really is spiritual and who is really playing a game. Paul had heard that there was there. Schisma, schismata is the word factions from which we get the word schism. This word means, refers to divisions come. It means uh, to, to be cutting or tearing, leading to divisions and dissensions. You know, if I were a deacon, here's what I'd do in this church. You ever heard that? Well, you know, our deacons, our trustees, our Sunday school superintendent, our elders, our preacher, just, you know, if I were there, this is what I'd do. Yeah, you're right. And so they go to somebody else and they say, you know what? So-and-so's got the answer. First thing you know, he's got a little group going around and causing dissension. But he says, must also be. That word is a very strong word. It's only three letters in the Greek. Delta, Epsilon, Iota. Day. 
And here's what it means. Must. You want to know how it's used somewhere else? John 3, 7. You must be born again. That word must be is three letters. Day. Now, would you say that's uh, strong? Must be. Yeah, it is. You want to know uh, another place where it's used? Look at Matthew 24, 6. You shall be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened for these things, what? Must take place. When Jesus said he had to go to the cross, I must go to the cross. That's how imperative that word is. These things, like I said to you at the beginning, these things will hit a church if they haven't already. And, and in many ways, the church has been successful over those. I'd have to say here at Countryside Bible Church, this is the first church. I've only pastored three churches since seminary. And I'm in my 62nd year. I want to tell you something. This is the first church I came where I didn't have doctrinal issues. For the most part. We had little things we worked through all the way through and still are. But we did not have major doctrinal issues. So he says, he says to them, the reason for these dissensions and factions is to reveal the approved people. Now that word... Dokimos. Now, I was a seminarian, went to Greek, and uh, we studied the word dokimos. It means to be approved in the fire and come out perfect. So, a bunch of kind of weird guys, we'd meet each other and we'd say, dokimos. Just one of those screwy things you pick up in school. It means to pass through the fire. It is used a precious metal that has been tried in the fire and proved to be genuine. So divisions come and troubles come, not shocked, not surprised. We have a devil that tries to attack us daily, not shocked at all. But for the person who's been approved, the person who has been knit together, the person who understands the word of God, the person who who knows all things through Christ, stands up and says, what can I do to cure this? What can I do to help? What can we do? In a sense, evil manifests good. That's what Paul is saying. Titus 3, verse 10 and 11 said, Reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Knowing that such a man is perverse and is sinning, being self-condemned. Do you know why a lot of churches stray away? They don't do this. They tolerate the air, hoping that somehow it'll go away. Oh, believe it, it never goes away on its own. <coughs> Proved men need to stand up and take a chance. How many denominations do you know that started out with an evangelist, evangelistic fervor and a study of the Word of God that are deader than a doornail today? What happened? They didn't take a stand. They didn't stand up to the air. That's what he's warning this church about. Jesus said himself, when I come back, will I find faith on the earth? Good question, isn't it? Godly leadership takes action when sin caused trouble to arise. They got together, they prayed, looked at the word and said, we got to take action on this. How many... How many Churches, have you heard, that practice church discipline? Hear a lot about that going on? No. But it has to happen to keep the church pure, to keep it on straight. 
I, I remember a message that was preached by Darren Roberts right after our, our uh, Man Up conference a couple years ago about Ananias and Sapphira. Remember that message, some of you? They put them, God put them out of the church because they lied about their offering. Now, we're not going to do that here if you lie about your offering. But the point, of course, is he dropped over dead. And they carried him out. His wife came in and told the same lie. They carried him out. You know what it says after that? People were afraid to join that church. Why? Because be sure your sin will find you out. And here's how they're going to do it. The enemy that comes in with persuasive argument. The word itself does not have a negative con, uh, con uh, negative uh, effect. It's a neutral word. Persuasive argument for the truth is good. But pervas pervasive argument for evil is bad. And in this context, it is bad in this context. The reader should come to the conclusion that false teachers are very eloquent and persuasive. Church is full of history of smooth talking charlatans. Right? They sound good. I listen to a music of a Music just because I like the music, but I wouldn't believe one word of what's being said there. They're smooth. They're smooth. Church and the platform of these charlatans is the pulpit. Can be the Sunday school class, radio, television, books, social media. The delusion comes with clever verbal gymnastics or with beautiful window dressing. One author put it this way. It signifies the employment of plausible arguments in contrast to demonstration. They can't demonstrate that it's true from the Bible, so they use oration. They use oratory. They use arguments. If you feel something's funny and it's going on, stay with the word. Stay with the word. I remember being with a guy and we were in a guy and this guy was not agreeing with us and the friend of mine was there with me and he said, well, I don't know about it, but I, I follow the word and I don't see this in the word, period. And conversation. It's not your job to argument. It's your job to know the word and know what the word says. And let the spirit of God use the word to convince. We are witnesses, not debaters. The word of God has its own innate power. It is God's word for heaven's sake. It can pierce a hard-minded heart. Like a... Uh, you're talking to some guy that's um, really everything is relative and you're coming with propositional truth. How are you going to convince him? It's all relative. It's like a friend of mine got in a philosophy ca class in college and the guy said, there's no absolute truth. Sir, then what you said is not true. <laughs> right? And it says it's enticing. Paul said in this verse it's enticing. Sounds good. It entices. Let nobody delude you. False teaching, error, and sin within the church come with secrecy and deceitfulness. Doesn't come bold truth. If somebody comes and says to me, what do you believe over there at Countryside Bible Church anyway? Why are people coming to this place? Our churches are dying. I said, I, you know what? I just tell them the truth. Tell them right out. 
you believe you should have women pastors? I say no. The Bible says we don't. Well, then I'm going somewhere else. Do you believe you should speak in tongues? I say no. Well, go somebody else. You need to tell the truth. I've had people that said, I'm not coming to your church, and later ended up at our church. I'd come to leave the church because I told them the truth. Didn't come back either. Had it both ways. But you see, we're not here to get as many people in this church as we can get. We want people who want to know the Word of God. Because we know the Word of God can change lives. We know the Word of God brings wisdom. The more you know about Christ, the clearer you see the world. The more you know about Christ, everything, and we sang that song this morning. I don't know if you caught it. But when you see Christ, the world is greener. When you know Christ, the sky is bluer. Because you see behind the blue sky, the firmament, the stars in the sky, the life on the earth. You see the designer and how brilliant he is. And the more you look at it, the more brilliant you see it. Wow, that's what I, I, I just appreciate the world in which I live. I realize it's cursed. And I'm going to drive to Oregon in a couple weeks. We're going to drive to Oregon and we're going to sit on, a, in, on the coast and watch the ocean. And I'm not going to do anything. People say, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not doing anything. I'll get up when I feel like it and I'll go to bed when I feel like it and I'll eat what I want. <laughs> Come back and fail at a diet. But the point, of course, is that I just enjoy watching uh, seagulls fly, pelicans fly, in a straight row, go over the wave. What a beautiful sight. I think uh, from what we understand, there are some whales that are there all year round. Maybe we'll see one jump. I remember I was fishing in, in Alaska and one jump right beside the boat. And I was shocked how big that thing was. And God took as much time making that well as he did the little amoeba that swims in a little pond. And there, by the way, I haven't seen any scientist produce a little amoeba that can reproduce itself, have you? It's the kind of God we have. How did I get there? And here's what he says about false teaching. Here's the goal of the church. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine. Have you heard this new truth? Listen, if it's a new truth, it's wrong. All the truth is in the Word. I was told in the seminary, if you don't footnote everything and you've come up with something wrong, you're in heresy. Because for 2,000 years, they've said it all. Look at verse 5. For though I am, I am absent in the body, or absent in the body, nevertheless, I'm with you in spirit. Rejoicing to see your good discipline and stability of your faith in Christ. It's almost like he has to apologize for not being there because he's mentioned this before. He, he's there in the spirit, not, although not physically. He knows enough from a Epaphras that he knows enough what's going on in that church and who the leaders are. And I rejoice to see your good discipline and stability. I know what that's like in part. I remember leaving a church and working with some people and left before we were done. And then hearing how, hearing how they're grown in the faith. 
what, what an encouragement. What a discouragement to hear the opposite. To hear the opposite. But man, I can rejoice with them. Rod, I remember when you taught Job. I remember when you taught Jonah. One guy came to Christ preaching in Jonah years ago. Told me about it. And you know what? I'm glad I didn't know about it. I'm glad God saves people without me knowing about it during the preaching of the word. You know why? I'd get too fat-headed. I couldn't handle it. He says, your good discipline. That word is toxin. Which a word, it's a military word, and it speaks of order. Seen in the arrangement of order in the military. Years ago, we were at the United States Air Force Academy, and we were viewing it, and near Colorado Springs, and we were standing on a platform, and it was noon. And all the groups came in for lunch. And the big side of this building opened up, and here were a block of servicemen walking step in step, militarized, and that whole block just turned same time and went in. That, that kind of procession brought tears to my eyes. They were ordered there. It wasn't chaotic. God loves that in 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But let all things be done in order. And then he says, also, Nehemiah built the wall in an orderly manner under the constant threat of attack. Look at this verse. They who are rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore a sword girded by his side as he built, while the trumpeter stood near me. I had a sword in one hand, and I had a trowel in the other. I built up the wall, and I protected the wall. That's what a church has to do. It's got to build up the people, and it's got to protect it. If all you do is build up, somebody will come and destroy it. If all you do is guard it, you'll never get anything built. The second thing Paul says is, I see your steadfastness. The word is steroma, steroma, from which we get steroid. There is the only place where this word is used in the New Testament. However, adjectives are used. For example, 2 Timothy 2.19. Nevertheless, here's our word, or at least the adjective, the firm foundation of God stands. Having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord. Is to abstain from wickedness. 1 Peter 5.8. Here we have it again. But resist him. Speaking of Satan. Firm in your faith. On steroids. Having the same experiences of suffering. Which are accomplished by your brethren. Who are in the world. And of your faith in Christ. That's twofold. A personal faith. I believe that God will lead us. God will protect us. God will take us to glory. Personal faith. And then there's another aspect. The faith. The truth. Jude says, contend for the faith. That's a doctrine. The biblical truths of the church. You know, a church that is steadfast. A church that is uh, st on steroid, biblical steroid, so to speak, that has order, that is knit together, that is trusting Christ, that is growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, can and will defeat the heresies that may want to creep in. Praise God, we have a defense mechanism. God is more interested in this church than any all of us put together. And he wants it to grow. He wants it to be a witness in this area. He wants people to notice who drive by. Why are all these people here? As a testimony to the glory of God. May God enrich us and help us to grow in grace. Let us stand for prayer. I thank you, Father.
that you have chosen us before the foundation to live in this time, in this area, and to attend this church geographically. I pray, Father, that you will strengthen us and use us and build us up. I pray, Father, that the word of God would penetrate our community from this body of believers who believe you. I pray, Father, that all of us would tuck in our shirt, roll up our sleeves spiritually, and become aware of your wisdom and of your strength, and stand for you, whether it be in the grocery store, the granary, the nurseries, the, uh, wherever we do business. May the glory of Christ be seen through us. And Father, encourage each and every one, we pray, who's here this morning, we ask in Jesus' name.